Okay, and we're live on The Niche Agent. So today we've got a great guest. It's Christopher Suarez from Portland, Oregon. You're with Keller Williams. So Christopher, why don't you take a quick second and tell us a bit about yourself and why you're here. Okay, awesome. So uh, again, my name's Chris Suarez. I live in Portland, Oregon right now. Uh, not a native, actually originally from New York. Uh, started my real estate career actually in New York, uh, born and raised there. Um, started in real estate out there, decided to move across the country. Uh, wound up in Eugene, Oregon for a bit. Uh, ran a real estate business there, and then moved up to Portland about six and a half, seven years ago. Uh, been uh, been a business development coach in the past, in the last four and a half years, uh, back in production, building a real estate business here in Portland. Awesome. So for you, what was that change? Happen? What happened for you to go from that production coach into selling real estate? Again. You know, yeah, great question. Uh, my, it, it was really just a matter of circumstance, to be honest. I had, uh, I had stepped into a leadership role and a and a coaching role, and the owner of the office that I was in actually uh, came to me one day and said, "Hey, you've been you've been coaching other agents, teaching them how to run a business properly. Would you be willing to step back in and model that and prove that uh, you can actually be make a million dollars in real estate by by really doing the activities that you're coaching agents to do. So it was really high accountability. Um, and, and about four and a half, five years ago, I said, sure, I'll do it, and uh, jumped in. Awesome. So this is the niche agent or niche agent. So for you, is it niche or niche? Uh, let's go with niche. All right, because we had our first American on. Um, it was Valerie Ford. She yep. said niche, so that was exciting for me to have an American say niche. Oh, so. <laughs> Um, okay, so your niche is you've kind of your claim to fame is, is open houses. So can you tell us a bit about your what you do with open houses and how you've made that part of your business? Yep, for sure. So um, what's interesting is uh, I, I've clearly I've moved right to three different cities um, and started a real estate business. Which which you know each time I did it, my broker said, "Hey, you're crazy. You've built a business. Why are you gonna Why are you going to start this all over again?" So for me, each time I've done that, my ultimate goal was knowing that real estate is a we're in a service industry, a customer service industry, and the only way we get to service customers is by building a database and connecting with people. Uh, many people start in the real estate industry thinking, hey, I'm going to connect with people I know, right? Past clients, sphere, people I've grown up with, gone to school with. Um, both times I've moved, I've not known anybody in that city. So for me, open houses was a way to immediately get in front of potential buyers, potential sellers, um, immediate buyers, immediate sellers. So, so really, it was a strategy to ultimately build the database. And so um, what I did, not knowing anybody, my mindset was I can sit in an office and try to figure this out, or every day my office can be an open house. So in starting in that new city, uh, both in Eugene and in Portland, my goal was to get out there and do an open house every single day, um, recognizing that it put me in the path of, of potential clients, and it allowed me the opportunity to very, very quickly add people to my database that I knew that if I followed up with consistently over time would would end up in, in closed business. And that's a great great point because a lot of agents, they fear they don't know how to do it. They think they're not going to get enough business from their friends or family and then they're afraid of cold calling or door knocking and things like that. But I, as a productivity coach, I tell new agents all the time, open houses are one of the best strategies. You're putting yourself in front of people who are looking for houses. So it's a high opportunity or a high chance that they're going to be a buyer or seller and you're getting it right in front of them. Yeah, and I agree. I agree. I think what's interesting about our industry is is people feel that, okay, I'm going to graduate from open houses. I'm going to start out doing open <laughs> houses and then and then when I finally right get a real business, I'll, I don't have to do those anymore and I'll just wait for other agents to do open houses on my listings. Where we've continued, I mean, regardless of production, we've continued on a systematic process of doing open houses. Now, all of our member, all the members of our team do open houses consistently. In fact, we have a commitment on the team that we do 50 open houses a year per person. So, with that, it's, it's, and our goal really, I think a lot of times we think open houses and we think, well, there's buyers that are going to come to that open house. Right. What we found, if we strategically structure that open house, market it effectively, and do a set number of activities, our goal is really to connect with neighbors and sellers, which we believe is the right the beginning of a of, of a big and good business and solid business is market share and sellers business. Yep, and, and that's a good point. And, and and I know you mentioned that you you did them every day. So can you talk a bit about that? Because I know a lot of agents, as soon as you say open houses, they think Saturday and Sunday, two to four, and they have this 
lock in on that's the only way to do it. I, yeah. I've tried to get people to just do a, one evening one, and they think they, they just can't think past that. So can you talk about, about the strategy and, and why you did that? Yeah, so um, one, because I had the time, right? I mean, I, I think of this business, it's it's you're going to give up either time or money to generate clients. And, and up front, for me, I had the time. Um, I didn't have the money. So I looked at that and said, the reality is I could sit in an office from 9 to 5 or go get a job from 9 to 5 or I could go and strategically put myself in the path of potential clients. So what I did was I connected with agents that had uh, vacant homes on the market um, and it could be only because it was easier to handle that or, or, or structure that and, um, and coordinate as opposed to connecting with owner-occupied homes. But, but strategically I looked at what homes can I sit in traffic patterns around times of the day that made sense. So for instance, uh, I had picked an open house that uh, was perhaps around a school district or a school during drop-off time. Why? Because I knew that there was going to be a steady stream of cars of people dropping off kids. And on the way, they're not going to stop at my open house. But perhaps on the way back from dropping off the kid, they would. And if nothing else, they'd see my signs in the morning and the next day and the next day. So I would do afternoons around or, or sort of mid-mornings mid around school. I do afternoon open certain days, and that was really around traffic patterns for um, lunchtime. So people that might be leaving an office park, heading to where uh, there may be food places or lunch places, I would make sure that I had a, a fairly um, obvious open house, uh, perhaps off a main, a main road where my signs could be, and I would get lunchtime traffic. And then I would do evening traffic or evening opens, early evening, and we would run them for about, from about 4 to 6 or 5 to 7 with the goal of, as people return home from work, uh, they would be heading back into their neighborhood, again, see our signs, it was branding, and then and then stop in. And because of that, really, it, it wasn't necessarily buyer traffic, but it was seller traffic that was interested in finding out, well, what's that home selling for? What does that house look like? Um, specifically because they lived in that neighborhood. Okay. So were you doing the same house seven days in a row? Were you doing seven different houses, or what was the strategy with that? No, it, it was... It, Really, I broke down the city into quadrants. I mean, Portland's easy to do that in, and I, and I, I looked at where do I want to do business, and now let me strategically get myself into those four quadrants. So it wasn't the same house every day. Um, it, I would alternate, um, but I would do um, multiple houses in that same neighborhood or in that same quadrant for that week. Then I'd go to you know the from northeast to southeast to southwest to northwest, and basically do them in, in groups. Okay. So can you share kind of the numbers and the volume of business that you were doing as a result of this? Because a lot of agents, they think it's a low production type uh, lead generation effort and they say, well, like you said, they're just going to get started with that until they get out in a higher production. You've had tremendous success with it. So can you share some of the numbers you've had? Yeah. Um, so, so it's, you know, the, I stepped into production halfway through the year. Uh, when I when I stepped in, and that was August. That first year, we wound up closing the year at about 10 million in real estate volume. Uh, our second year, we did we went from 10 to about 21, so my, our full year, which makes sense, right? 21, yep. 22. Uh, the year after that, we did 41, 42 million. Um, last year, we closed 72 million in volume. Wow. Um, and obviously, as we grew, we added in different lead generation strategies. But what's interesting is we didn't give up on the ones that got us there. Uh, we have a we have a business model that we believe that every lead generation source should we should be able to build that to about a 20 million dollar business. So once we once we get to the point where we say, okay, guess what? This lead generation strategy can 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 bring us 20 million volume, then we'll layer in another lead generation strategy. So for us, that open house strategy really should be getting us to about a 20 million dollar volume, really, as a, as a core lead gen strategy. And that's a great point, and I, I mention that to people all the time, is before you tackle anything else, have it on autopilot, have it mastered before you tackle anything else. So get good at it, be amazing at it, and don't try seven different lead generation strategies. Like you said, if your number is $20 million, you know that's kind of that sweet spot where you know you're ready to be able to, to take on something else. So for you, how long did it take until you started doing other lead generation, or were you doing other lead generation sources in that in that beginning phase? So about six months into it, we started layering in a little bit of mail. 
uh, and, and really that mail was specific to our, our open house strategy. So we'd be mailing the neighborhoods we were doing opens in. Before that, we did not actually mail anything. We just didn't have a budget for it. But as right. we started to, to write closed deals and, and generate some GCI, we, we, we attributed about 10% of our GCI back to a lead generation budget, which then started going into the neighborhoods that we were doing the open houses at. Invitations, uh, market statistics, um, but really straight into that neighborhood. Uh, then we layered in phone calls to the to basically a hundred neighbors around that open house. We'd get in, we'd make phone calls uh, to the neighbors, letting them know that we're going to be doing the open house. And then the third thing we layered in later, and uh, probably last because it was the the least the least uh, well our least liked form is actually right knocking on doors around those open houses. So it's interesting is that open house became sort of of uh, sort of. Uh, a, a multi-tiered open house strategy where now we're mailing to them, they're seeing our signs, we're knocking on their door, and they're probably getting a message or a phone call from us. Um, so we're connecting with auditory people, kinesthetic people, hopefully as they walk through, visual people with mail. We know that people connect on, on different levels, and that was our strategy in, in making sure that we hit them in, in different ways. Okay, so were you doing anything outside of the ordinary then? Because like, I know a lot of people will do the typical things. They'll put the signs on the corner, they put some balloons on, and they sit in the open house. Were you doing anything outside the box to, to generate the traffic there? Yeah, so I mean our strategy, and it's pretty simple, but our strategy is we're always a week in advance. We choose our open houses a week in advance, so that's day one. Day two, uh, where our administrative people are going out and getting all the information we need, right? We're getting call lists, we're getting mail lists. Day three, an invitation gets mailed out and our phone calls start, 100 neighbors around that, around that open house. Day three also, uh, either the agent or an administrative person goes out and puts a coming soon, or a, an open house on Saturday, or open house on Wednesday, or open Sunday, just a sign in front of that house. And what we found is, not only does it drive traffic, mostly it's neighbors, right? It's neighbors that pass that sign again and again and again, which is, right, seller traffic. Yeah. Um, but we also started getting calls for, off of that open house sign saying, hey, I saw that you're open. And we, we wound up generating some sign call traffic off of that as well. Um, we, we post it online um, on, from day one, so day three, four, five, six, and seven is posted online. Social media goes up on day four, five, and six. Um, and the door knocking happens on the day of the open house. And, and our strategy is really just at this point, I mean, I'm going to be honest, to knock on 10 doors. Okay. We started saying, hey, we want to knock on 50, and it wasn't happening. And I think what happened is the mindset was, if I can't do 50, I'm not going to do any of them. Right. So as a team, we just committed and said, hey, if we can knock on 10 doors every open, we will see the results, and sure enough, we did. Okay. So... For you, what's the market like? Because I know here we have, some of the agents have struggled with because because things are selling so fast where we are, um, people are having a hard time even getting a good open house, and it's kind of like three or four days before the open house, and they're like, okay, you need to get it on this weekend and get it done. Was your market a long like? Did you have a long time on the market, or what was it like for you guys? Well, when we started, sure. I mean, when we started uh, five years ago, there was a longer marketing time. Now, there's not, right? We're, I mean, days on market, it's pretty tight. In the neighborhoods that we targeted and now we're doing business in, it's even, right, it's even shorter than the city average. Right. But regardless of whether or not that home sells, we've begun to market it, we've begun to advertise it, and we still hold that open. Because ultimately, our real focus at the end of the day is to connect with sellers in that neighborhood. And there's nothing better to tell a seller than, yeah, we marketed this, uh, we put it on the market on Tuesday, and Saturday, when they walk through the open house, we've already sold it. So we don't have any problem. I mean, this weekend, we two of our open houses were sold on Friday, but our open house was on Sunday. Okay. So that doesn't bother us at all, and we continue to, you know, most agents, quite honestly, what I hear is, oh, wow, awesome, we sold it on Friday, we can cancel our open house on Sunday. <laughs> yeah. Which means we're doing open houses out of feeling like we have to for our seller, as opposed to we're doing it for a lead generation strategy and build our database. And one strategy that I find works well is when it is sold conditionally, it actually creates a better demand when you're at the house and you say, well, this house is sold um, conditionally, but I can show you some similar properties or something like that if you're interested, and then it creates that buzz. Absolutely, yep. For so sure. a lot of I know a lot of agents struggle with they know how to get traffic in the door. They're fine with that, but it's the, the day of. You get people coming in. It's that, what do you say first? 
what do you do? Do you get them to sign in? Do you force them to sign up a registry? Are you handing them a brochure? Can you kind of walk through what your strategy is with that? Yeah, yeah great question. Um, because I think that is the key to w how we've been able to get actual, right, build an actual database from it. So uh, we've, we've developed one question um, as they walk through the door. And this one question, I would say, has really transformed our open house business. And, and simply, as they walk through the door, we ask them, uh, are you out shopping for a for a home today or do you happen to live in the neighborhood? Are you out shopping for a home today or do you happen to live in the neighborhood? And immediately we know how we're going to handle that person. They're either a buyer or we know that in our world, whether they're thinking about selling or not, one day they're going to sell their home. So they're immediately a seller. So if they live in the neighborhood, great, we love that. They're a seller and now our conversation is geared towards values in the neighborhood, how long they've lived there, and ultimately our goal, if they say they live in the neighborhood, oftentimes people don't want to sign in, and so we don't we don't necessarily use a sign-in sheet. Um, but I know that if I can get their last name and they live in the neighborhood, I don't even need to I don't need to get their address because immediately I put in their last name. We we operate all of our agents have an iPad, um, so we do use uh, Bright Open. It's an app that allows us to basically have a it, it produce, and I think it's really through real, realtor uh, realtor.org or realtor.com, realtor.org. Um, but basically, it'll, it'll uh, show a flyer of your house and allows you to email them a flyer if you wanted to use that app directly. Um, we don't use print. So as we start talking to them, ultimately going back to our process, administratively, before that open house, we, we set up a, a Dropbox um, for the open house. And in that Dropbox is a flyer of the home. Um, uh, there are comps for the home uh, around the neighborhood or around that house, and then there is basically what we call a total market overview, which is really just what's going on in this neighborhood statistically. So we have three items of value that our goal is for one of those things to appeal to either a buyer or a seller, and then offer to email it to them live from the open. So if they want a flyer, we don't print flyers, but we can email it to them. And in order to email it to them, right, we immediately get their email and their name and, right, their email address is now on a Google Doc that administratively, right, the day, the next morning, our team comes in, pulls in that information, puts them in our, on, in our CRM or our database, and then they get put onto a campaign. So whether they're a buyer or a seller. And so that strategy of not having stuff for people to take, what happened was people would come in, take our stuff, and we'd never hear from them. Yep. Now our goal is really to get some sort of contact information, and the only real way is we feel that if we provide value, they should be willing to give us their contact information. Yeah, I'm a big believer in getting their information. A lot of agents want to, like I said, they print everything off, and they want to hand that out, and then there's that kind of, that cuts the communication off there. They got what they wanted, and they're gone. When you can, like you said, provide the value to them, they'll be willing to give that information and get it, and they get it instantly, and you can pitch it. I think I saw you do a presentation, you were talking about being green. You can pitch it as a, oh, we're trying to save paper, and they'll give their email. And an email, to me, is better than just a name and a bogus phone number, because if they really want it, they'll give you a real email address. Right, exactly. And, and, and from that, if they don't give us their email, and that's okay, right? We, we all will find people that are just fairly private, and they just, they're not interested. They don't want to be stalked, or they don't want to be contacted <laughs> afterwards. Um, but most people have a difficult time not not giving them, giving their name if you ask. And oftentimes, right, so I'll say, what was your name? And they might say Bob. And 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 right out, Bob isn't going to do me any good in, in tax records of trying to find that seller and their address. So I'll, I'll say, and what was your last name? And by saying that, it is a very awkward thing for them to have to not give it to you. So the minute I get a last name and I know they live in the neighborhood, they will end up in our database. They will get a thank you card for stopping by or open. And now they will automatically be mailed out a market report monthly to their home. So we built a really, really large database of people that have connected with us, know us, have seen us in the neighborhood. And then we become that source of information of statistics for their, for their market and where they live. Do you find you get kickback from people who, like, it sounds like you get their name and then you just send them something, so they're not even asking for their address. Do you find anybody having any problems scared out that you're just, you're sending them stuff and you found their information online? I would say in the last five years, we've had probably six or seven people call us and say, hey, can you remove us from your mailing list? I'm right. okay with that. that that's good, good numbers. Because I know a lot of agents are, they 
predetermined this fear or that someone's going to freak out on them or they're going to get upset with them because they sent them something and they never even do anything. And if they just did it and sent it, you may get some people that are upset or get or just ask not to be on it. But the, the amount of business you're going to get from it is going to far away a couple people that are getting upset. Right. And I think, I mean, ultimately, what in that thank you note, uh, it's a handwritten card, right, which who gets those anymore, but it's just a handwritten yeah. card that says, hey, thanks for stopping if we're open. We appreciate the support from the neighbors. If you think of anyone that wants to move into the neighborhood along the way while we have it on the market, please let us know. Um, door, you know, throughout, over time, we'll keep you up to date with what's going on in your neighborhood. If you should have any real estate questions, uh, please feel free to call me and there's a business card. So ultimately we've asked permission in writing. They can't say no obviously over mail. They can call us and say no, but we've asked permission and told them that we would keep them up to date with what's going on in the market. So whether you decide to to mail something every every month or every other month, that's fine, but but it is at that point it has become permission marketing because we've asked. So how many people are you getting through your open houses and how many would you say are converting into business because that's another thing a lot of agents get stuck on they don't know what's a good number they like how, I've, I've had this many people come through and I haven't done any deals do you have a metric for that 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 you found is an average or that works for you guys yeah I mean our you know it's funny because no the answer to that question is we don't <laughs> necessarily say okay by with this many people this is how much business we we get or expect we can see what that average is although I think setting that expectation what happens is the minute you do seven or eight opens and you don't hit that number you say oh this doesn't work here it's not working for me and you stop right. so we don't necessarily say okay this is what our target is but I know by doing as a team ultimately when when we're doing 50 open houses per person um, ultimately, that becomes about 15% of that individual agent's business year over year. Wow. So, you know, from, from my business last year, about 15% of our business came from open houses. And, right, that's a big business. Yep. You know, 15% of 70 million. So, uh, there, and, and what's interesting about that is it is a, it's a long term strategy as well. We've closed, we've closed listings and sellers this year from open houses that we did. You know, our fir my first year in Portland. Uh, so, you know, five years ago, uh, we have something in contract as we speak today, a condo in downtown Portland, and it was it was someone that came into an open house five years ago. So it is a it's right. It's a numbers game and it's a consistency game, just like the rest of our businesses. Yeah, and it, it does fill feed that database to build it for long term success. Uh, an agent I used to work with, Jason, he built his whole business on open houses. He did his first year. He did 18 deals, brand new to the business. Or sorry, 21 deals, 18 of them were from open houses. And then every year after that, he was doing 50 deals a year. And he said it was from those open houses that spiraled into that, and he got that much repeat business because he built that solid database. Yeah, I think I mean conceptually, our whole business. My entire business is built around really the uh, the concept and philosophy of of the Millionaire Real Estate Agent book, right? So in there, it, it clearly outlines that hey, you know, whether you like this or not, if if you want a big business, we're a database business. So figure out what strategies you're going to use to add people to that database, and then systematically and consistently, right, communicate with that database on a on a daily, weekly, monthly, yearly basis. And then it's mindshare. It's how do we create mindshare for the people that we've already met face to face at that open house, or our team has met face to face at this point as the team has grown. Right. Well, I want to go more into what your follow-up system is like, but I want to ask a few questions before I, I move on to that. I've had a few people ask me some questions to ask you. So, do you, when you're having an open house, do you restrict the number of buyers coming through, or do you just kind of let everyone come in? Because I know some people have a one person at a time strategy, and they kind of escort them through. Or what's what's your system like for that? Nope, uh, we don't. I mean, we as many people as want to come through, come through. What 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 I will say that we have done is in specific neighborhoods, and I think every city has them, where you know that hey, it's a it's a it's a really tight market. There's no inventory, and this will there will be a lot of people show up. We will actually send a couple agents, so we will have two agents at that house, um, and and basically our goal is to just instead of having 20 people through and, and getting five people's names, we have 20 people through and are able to collect 10 people's names. So it'll be neighborhood based, but uh, ultimately, you know, we don't restrict the number of agents through. Okay. Well, do you buyers. have Do you have an ideal? like an avatar for an ideal house or type of property that you go after or do you just kind of 
go after what's out there. I mean, obviously now you've built your own business, you're probably doing your own open houses, but when you're getting started, did you have that, this is the type of property I want to go after? Yeah, and it was it was geographic, demographic, and economic. I mean, so we, we, we did opens in the neighborhoods that we wanted to do business in. We did opens in the price range we wanted to do business in. Uh, we did opens in, in, in where we felt uh, there was a higher turnover, or, and, and not felt, but where we where, where we researched, there was a higher turnover ratio because ultimately, if the goal is to connect with sellers, we want them right. We want more sellers in the neighborhood selling than not. So we really strategically pick where those open houses were going to be. So yeah, some people have a farm. They want to go after a certain farm, especially a newer agent. They want to start doing in a farm, but they don't have the inventory available. Would you go outside of your brand or outside of your brokerage to try to do that, or have you have you had anybody do that, or have you ever done open try to do open houses on other people's uh, listings? Uh, you know, that's going to be location specific. So here, and and actually, depending on your ENO insurance. So our ENO ENO insurance doesn't actually allow us to hold open another broker's. Okay. Uh, listing, believe it or not. So, but for for me starting out, um, I was in an office that was a highly productive office, which right helped me actually uh, help me one be around successful people, but two, there was always listings available. And, okay. and honestly, that that's a right. If if you're in a in an office or a brokerage that that does is not a listing based broker brokerage, it's it is 100% going to be more difficult to run an open house business. So, in looking at your lead generation platform or your system or what you're picking, you know, be selective about that. And that was going to be the other question I was going to ask you is how many agents did you have and kind of how many listings at any given time did your office have? Because if you're coming from an office of 10, 15, 20 people, there may not be that inventory. It may not be the ability to, have, to be able to do seven a week or even one a week. So did, what, what were you working with when you got started? Uh, it's been different. So when I was in Eugene, smaller office, there was probably, uh, uh, there was probably still 30 agents or so. But it, in that situation, it only takes one vacant house, right? You need one vacant house that one, that one listing agent has to be able to say, hey, do you have a problem with me holding this home, home open until the day it sells? And, and if that's what you got, that's what you work with. And, right. and, and I guarantee you if you sat that one house, one, you're going to sell it. But, but two, along the way, uh, between day one and day 21 of holding that house open, you are going to meet another seller and you'll create your own inventory. That's a good point. Uh, for when you were gotten more productive, what size of office were you working in, and how many listings were you guys kind of carrying? Then? Um, well, now, now I have uh, I have two hundred and twenty five agents in my office, and we're it, we're the number one office in the in the city of Portland. So, and and we sell more listings than any other office in town too. So, at any point in time, there may be six hundred eight six hundred listings for. For us to choose, and right, you know, we we carry an inventory right now of about 50 listings, which is which is our business model. So we'll always have now one of our own own listings to hold up. Okay. But with that said, I'll tell you, even if we don't, and we want to be in a mar in a market, even with all the listings that we have, we'll have one of our buyers agents go and target another neighborhood and and hold someone else's listing open if we don't have something in that neighborhood and we want listing inventory. Okay, that's that's great advice. So, I mean, I want to be uh, careful of your time. So, I want to go back into just wrapping up of kind of your follow-up system and what you're doing once you get that name. How often are you touching them? What are you sending them? And, and what's that look like for you guys? Uh, so, if it's a seller, um, ultimately uh, we will, and we've met them. Now, our goal is to to over the first eight weeks that we've connected with them, connect with them about five six times. So, there's a thank you card. There's a market report. There might be a news article that we send, especially if we have email. If we have email, it's easy. We're not sending something in the mail um, eight times in eight weeks. Um, but ultimately, if we have their email address, we will connect with them via email. And, and our goal in the first, basically the first few weeks that we connect is to develop a relationship with them. And then from there, uh, our follow-up system is fairly easy. We send one marketing report every single month. Um, and that's specific to their neighborhood. So there's 12 touches. We we look we look to call everybody in our database quarterly. So there's another four touches. Um, we do uh, some four seasonal pieces as well. So there's four touches, right? So now we're up to 12 plus four plus four. Um, and then we'll specifically do every every six months. We'll reach out and ask them if they would like an updated value of their home. 
So we're about anywhere from 22 to 28 touches um, a year on our potential sellers. With buyers that we meet in an open house, it is a, it is a lot more sort of upfront touches. We have a um, a, a 10 days of, of reaching out to them every single day, to be honest. And, and our buyer's agents, right, we are emailing them or calling them every day until they either set up a time to meet with us for a buyer consultation or say, you know what, um, I'm a little ways out. And we'll classify them as, a, as an A, B, or C buyer. So our goal um, really is to divide everybody we meet into uh, one of four categories. It's an immediate seller or a future seller, an immediate buyer or future buyer. And that's really how our campaigns are built out in our in our CRM. Awesome. Yeah, that's that's good to know because a lot of people I find with an open house they kind of have one strategy after, regardless of their neighbor, a buyer, a seller, whatever. They're just they kind of just send them a thank you card, they make a couple calls, and then they give up after them. So that's good to to see how you laid out and following the model of the 33 touch and, and staying in contact with them. So. I want to wrap up quickly, and if you can give us a, a golden nugget, a good piece of advice for someone if they're getting started doing those open houses, just from the trenches, from you, you doing it yourself, what's a good piece of advice you can give to our listeners? Um, you know, one thing I would say is, especially if you're just getting started, right, and, and you're you're going to be committing to open houses, it's it's committing, committing to that open house process. There's going, there may be days, weeks. Um, that go by where you have very limited traffic, and so that's typically where people say, right, they get burned out on it. But I, but I always liken our ability to make money in this industry and compare it back to how many, how many hours would it take to actually make that money that month at a regular job? And yet, for some reason, we convince ourselves that we don't have a job, right? So, in in my world, an open house is typically two hours. It's about an hour of prep and an hour of follow-up. So you're looking at about a, a four to five hour process. And honestly, if you signed up and you worked four or five hours a day and you did an open house five days a week, you will make more money than, than the 90% than, than of real estate agents in this country. It's just that we stop. We don't yeah. come in and say, right, hey, this is what I'm going to do. I know that it's over time going to work and I'm going to build a very, very big business. So it's a system. It, but, but working for yourself and doing, doing open houses, um, it, it's, easy to, it's easy to cancel it, not do it, not schedule one. So for me, it was either, hey, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to be, and I was, I, I'm going to be a waiter and a bartender forever, or I'm going to make this system and process work to build a business that I own. And, and, and it, you know, open houses was the first strategy I used. It really doesn't matter, as you know, right? You pick that niche and develop it, and eventually you, the goal of a big, my goal of a big, big business is to have one, two, three, even four niches that you develop and grow, and that's how, right, the goal for the year is 100 million as opposed to 20. Yeah, that's amazing advice and timely advice because I have a number of my students in the productivity coaching who are kind of getting started with the, the open houses and I told them I'm going to be doing this episode and I, it's good advice because it's not just coming from me. Having a third party endorsement who's done it, it definitely helps. So so that's good and for the listeners, that's great advice as well. So um, can you tell us a bit about how people can get a hold of you? I know you've got a coaching program so if you can talk about, about that and, and how people can find that as well. Yeah, happy to. So, um, and and I'm always open for for feedback. As as any of your coaching clients are might be struggling or hitting that wall with open houses, they anyone can reach me. Um, I'm here in Portland. Again, my phone number is five zero three seven four eight eighty three hundred. I'm always available. Uh, and in my coaching program is actually just a fast track. It's a three month course that breaks down MREA. So really, the the name of the course is Model Your Way to a Million. It's really how what steps do I take to immediately get into production and build an MREA business around the four models in that book. Um, people can go to mapscoaching.com and find it under group coaching. It's basically a three-month course. Uh, and in terms of just connecting with me, uh, my, my team is PDX Property Group. So you can go to PDX Property Group, pdxpropertygroup.com and uh, find my email, find my phone number, and reach out. Awesome. And we'll put all those in the show notes below. Um, I just want to clarify, too, then, for the people who aren't not with Keller Williams, is that open to them, the coaching program, and if maybe explain the MREA and that kind of thing, because not everyone may not know. Awesome, I appreciate that. Yeah, so so I, I coach with agents, and, and agents take part in that uh, of any of every company. 
Um, basically, MREA is is the Red Book, right? It's a it's a book that I found nine years ago in a bookstore, and I read through this book called The Millionaire Real Estate Agent. It's uh, it's it's not company specific. It was written by Gary Keller, and ultimately, it's right. It's the number one real estate book that's that's ever been sold, um, and and it's a business model for those that truly want to look at real estate and say, hey, I, I just don't want to sell houses, but I want to own a business. What's interesting about that model is I and I struggled to, to implement that model for the first six years of my career, and it wasn't until I committed to take time right and get into coaching, and I realized, man, if a system or a model or a coaching program could just get people to understand how to implement these four models in their business, and it doesn't take very long, if we had that, it would fast track people, right? It, it would get people to grow that business and then start implementing the strategies that you folks do, right? Getting, taking this niche or niche and, and fitting this into the four models, right? What, what lead generation strategies are we, gonna, are we gonna go through? So basically it takes the economic model, the lead generation model, the budget model, and then ultimately the organizational model. And our goal is in a 90 day period for one, right, one hour a week, to build out an entire real estate business, basically modeling it after agents that have successfully been able to net a million in real estate in a very short period of time. And then I think about that fast track is it helps you get started because I know I've read the MREA three times. I'm on about to start my fourth. That first time you read it, it's scary as heck. It seems overwhelming. It, it's perfectly laid out and it's clear, but it's where do you start? It seems very overwhelming. So a lot of agents they know what they should be doing, they kind of don't know where to start. So that's a great program, so if someone is interested in getting that kickstart and kind of knowing they want to apply it and know, know actually learning how to apply it and when and where to do it. So we'll definitely put the link to that below as well. So again, Chris, thanks for being on the show. We appreciate it. Thank you for the insights and your valuable information, and I know the listeners are definitely going to appreciate that. Awesome. No problem. My pleasure. I appreciate it. Thank you. Thanks for being on. Yep.